Awesome. To those of you that have joined us already, welcome. Good morning, wherever you are. We'll get started yeah, shortly. Hmm. Give us... So, magandang umaga, kabayan. Welcome. Uh, friends from the south, uh, maayong adlaw sa inyong tanan. So, hello and welcome to today's session of Let's Talk. My name is Lawrence. So, house rules muna tayo for now. Uh, you can write uh, your questions in the Q&A uh, below. All questions will be answered after the presentation. Okay, let's proceed. Did you know what is the common cause of machine failure? You can write your answer in the question, uh, Q and A below. Okay. So according to article of uh, ludisa.com, the number one failure of machine is, can I see if there's an answer? So, uh, the number one common cost of uh, machine failure is misalignment. Misalignment occurs when two shaft center line of rotation is not concentric. Even today, some professional assures that the coupling will deal with the misalignment. However, misalignment tolerance built into the coupling merely show how much misalignment the coupling can handle and still transfer power. They are not designed to magically make the machine misalignment disappear. Coupling fails for several reasons, but the primary cost of is the improper coupling selection for particular applications such as excessive misalignment, improper, inadequate, or insufficient lubrication, harsh environment, or operating conditions, and excessive speed and loads. In the next 45 minutes, you will learn the basics of couplings, be familiar with all the available types out there in the market today, and know how to select the right coupling suitable for various applications, including basic troubleshooting. Our speaker is born and raised in South Africa. He's a mechanical engineer and management professional. He has a vast experience in power transmission application before he joined MI Pacific formerly known as the Enenco Group Australia in 2017. He is responsible for the general management of APT Far East based in Singapore. He has been instrumental in growing the Fenner brand in Asia Pacific region. Leading a group of product engineers based on various Southeast Asian countries, he is committed to continue expanding FPT's distributor partner network and key strategic customer. Let's get some insights from the man who has been there in critical applications and done it. Would you please welcome Donald Braley? Awesome, Lawrence. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. It's great to connect with all of you and wherever you are. I know today we focused on uh, supporting our, our customers in the Philippines, but we might have some attendees from other parts of the world. So welcome, and it's, uh, I hope you're all safe out there. And today we'll kick off with a basic introduction and then move quite quickly. So again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, type them into the Q&A box and we'll get to them towards the end. And I look forward to interacting with, with all of you. So today's uh, webinar is brought to you in association with our partner in the Philippines. Uh, distributor Arbor. They're based and headquartered in Cebu. They've been around, founded in 2002, uh, and they're a great partner for us. So I'd like to thank them for supporting us in the Philippines. Lawrence works very closely with the team in Arbor. And if you've got any questions and follow-ups, please uh, reach out to us and, and we can always link you up with our distributor partner there on the ground, ready to support you. So an introduction to couplings, and for some of you today, you probably know uh, some of these basics, but just to recap, uh, historically, what are couplings and where did they come from? 
So the idea basically through the industrialization of the world, we needed to connect and transmit power, mechanical power. And the initial uh, methods were basically two rigid flanges uh, bolted together to connect the two shafts. Uh, obviously then in order to accommodate some misalignment, they started to reduce the thickness of those uh, flanges to allow some flex, which inevitably caused other issues like fatigue failures uh, and inadequate uh, capability to transmit the torque. So that is a, a beautiful start. And as we've gone through the ages in industrialization, we've learned a lot more uh, and I'll touch base on some of those now. So what is the basic principle? Well, effectively we wanna connect two shafts to transmit the torque. So for those engineers with us, we all know that uh, torque, power, and speed are closely related uh, and can be calculated. So you now need to, in the physical world, actually join those two mechanical shafts. And in this basic overview, you can see a, a depiction of an electric motor connected uh, with a coupling and then joining to a basic centrifugal pump. So, of course, transmit the torque, which is the most important part. So that's the speed and power. If you do the calculations, speed, power, you'll get torque with a, a constant. So, of course, it's important to understand that there's a few deeper aspects we must consider in a coupling. And, and that is inherently when we install, it's also there will be some misalignments and inaccuracies with the foundation or the fabrication of a base plate and therefore the coupling is there to help uh, absorb some of those misalignments that are caused during installation or during operation. So a typical layout you'll see uh, we're going to discuss the flexible couplings and this is to accommodate misalignment. So you'll have a typical electric motor joined with a high-speed coupling to an elect uh, gearbox or speed reducer this is a very common uh, application and then a, a low speed coupling onto maybe uh, anything like a ball mill grinding mill uh, or anything else that you might have on your equipment so of course each of these couplings must handle some misalignment while transmitting the torque so classifications of couplings this is quite interesting as a basis to understand uh, typically, there are a number of areas that we would consider as couplings joining two shafts. If you look on the uh, left-hand side, uh, the, the major category of couplings, you have rigid and flexible. And in that, on the rigid side, you might find that those rigid couplings are in some limited applications these days. We've obviously advanced with technology and we start looking at things like positive engagement couplings and also friction engagement couplings. For those of you in the mining industry or cement, you probably have some of these friction couplings, uh, hydrodynamic couplings or fluid couplings, which allow for soft starting on conveyor systems. And then on the today's topics, we'll focus more on the positive engagement uh, couplings and more specifically around gear and uh, steel membrane couplings. But bear in mind that there is a big area of clutches, which would also be considered couplings, um, where you are controlling the torque, you're controlling some speed, um, and there are various different designs available uh, from various manufacturers. We won't talk about those today, but those are an interesting aspect of shaft couplings especially the freewheel clutches and overrunning clutches. All right, so the primary function we spoke about was connecting the two shafts to transmit torque, and then of course compensate for misalignment. Again, a better picture here with an electric motor joining to a centrifugal pump. There is your coupling sitting smack bang in the middle. So it's a critical, critical component to plant reliability. So what are the types of misalignment? So typically, as you can see from this photo, this is a, a lovely installation, looks quite well controlled, great fabricated base plates, 
uh, with a, a well-finished surface. Uh, and this is a, a good installation example of, of the level of quality uh, you should expect from a pump installation and where you would be installing couplings. So typically we look at parallel misalignment and offset. And this is where you, your two shaft centers are on the parallel axis, they are offset. And this is a, a tricky uh, misalignment characteristic because this can be caused by improper installation or uh, some fabrication issues at the beginning uh, when building the base plate for your, your installation. Then of course we have angular misalignment and angular misalignment can come about usually installation issues or during operation, you might have some problems where the base moves or the structure uh, of your installation shifts. And this can happen in, from time to time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in areas where you have seismic activity, sometimes you do have base plates moving um, or yeah, just major, major challenges if the, the location is, is disrupted. So of course, that's where couplings can be quite useful because they can handle that misalignment. All right, so the two types that we'll, we'll focus on, yeah, shaft misalignment. Um, so we call it, that's the relationship between the driver and the driven. So for the correct terminology, a driver can typically be electric motors. That's what we usually deal with, but you also get diesel uh, engines uh, that are common in some power installations, power generation installations, um, as well as steam turbines. Those are sort of the three most common types of drivers that we come across in the industry. And then of course the driven is your application that you are turning. So it could be a pump, it could be gearbox, it could be a conveyor system, uh, various different driven uh, shafts effectively. All right, so here we are, you can see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, we have parallel misalignment. So it's a little bit better of a, an accurate uh, photo. You can see the two shafts are offset. You've got your angular misalignment, pretty self-explanatory and then axial. Now bear in mind, axial is quite an interesting uh, misalignment characteristic. This can come about when you have temperature changes. So we all know that steel, when, when steel and metal heats up, it expands. So as, that, as the shaft increases in temperature, it can expand and this will then cause axial movement of the shaft. So this is an important characteristic where the coupling then needs to accept that axial movement and without damaging other components. This is also very common axial misalignment in things like refiners and pulp and paper industry, where, where the, uh, the electric motor is typically on uh, sliding bearings um, and you then have movement of the, of the uh, rotor of the electric motor when it starts operating. So this then shifts the whole shaft of the motor. And of course, then the coupling needs to accept this axial movement. And then also just a note to everyone here, if you uh, are experiencing difficulties, just put a note into the uh, Q&A section and we can hopefully attend to those. And if you do have a question, just type it in the Q&A part and we'll, we'll reach out to that at the end. All right, so compensate for end movement. I just explained the, the axial, axial misalignment. And of course, this is an important aspect where couplings need to, to handle this type of misalignment. So pay attention when, you, when you're looking at a new installation or an existing application at your factories, uh, these are some considerations, especially if you have a condition monitoring team and they're looking at frequent failures. Often these are areas that you can then uh, dig into and understand what could be the root cause failure or what type of new uh, design coupling you need to select for the new application. 
So uh, that's why these are an important aspect to consider. All right, some additional functions for, for couplings. Um, and these come about where they're sort of like nice to have. Uh, dampening vibration. And this therefore reduces your, your peak loads or your shock loads. You can also, couplings can protect equipment from overload. You can also use couplings to measure output torque of a driven equipment. This can be pretty important in some uh, high precision applications, um, specifically in pharmaceutical or uh, FMCG types of applications where you want to understand what is happening um, at that physical shaft. So you can measure the torque through a coupling. Uh, electrically insulate the driver from the driven equipment. Again, electricity and electrical arcing, and a great topic to dig deeper into. Uh, we see a lot of bearing failures caused by electrical arcing. Uh, I won't go too much into that, but couplings can be used to isolate between two shafts. So sugar industry, where they, they mill and grind sugar, many times they, they need to isolate certain shafts because of their process. Um, again, uh, in common newer designs, we, we often use variable, variable speed drives, VSDs, and these have their own problems with electrical arcing. Um, so in those circumstances, you probably can look at an insulating type of coupling to, to help prevent arcing going through your electric motor and into your gearbox or into your application. Then couplings, you know, position a rotor um, and basically timing. So you can then have a very accurate coupling to make sure that your timing between two shafts is, is accurate. Um, and then, of course, we can have things like tuning for uh, torsional analysis. So in some larger applications, specifically where you have higher speeds um, and fan applications, you need to use the coupling to adjust the vibration uh, and the torsional analysis of your system. So couplings can play a vital role in that, either by stiffening the system or uh, reducing the stiffness of the system, but mostly it's to increase the stiffness. All right, so we're going to talk about, uh, again, we're still on, on misalignment here, so I need to just jump ahead a little bit. So effectively, dampening vibration is quite a, a great advantage of couplings. Some of the rubber style couplings, uh, you'll get a lot of dampening uh, of vibration, and this helps protect your system. So if we look at misalignment, is three degrees of misalignment okay? Well, it always depends on the type of coupling you select and also some other parameters of the application. Bear in mind, a small change at the, at the back of a motor can have a big impact at the shaft where the coupling is being used. So with shaft misalignment, you get vibration and this causes equipment failure. All right, so if you get alignment right, you can get increased bearing life, you can reduce your maintenance budget, and you can increase machine availability. And we'll talk about these topics a bit later in the webinar. And of course, uh, we might not reach it, but we can talk about it afterwards if, you, if you're interested to discuss further. So let's talk about coupling types now. So and I hope this is uh, interesting for everybody. We're going to kind of focus down elastomeric. So these are couplings where you use various rubber materials, um, synthetic rubbers, EPDM, there's a lot of uh, research that's going into these uh, areas of elastomeric elements. And there's typically two, compression and shear. As the words explain, compression is where the rubber is being compressed. And this is typically a jaw type of coupling, very common in an industry. And then shear is where the rubber is being torn or sheared in the shear plane. And this is your tire coupling, which I must say Fenner is the pioneer for. So tire couplings are something uh, Fenner designed many years ago. Uh, and there are some advancements like Rexnord have uh, their Omega design where they, they have bonded or vulcanized rubber directly to metal. So there are some advancements there, um, but 
the old tried and tested method of tire coupling has still stood the test of time. So typical pros and cons, rubber couplings or um, elastomeric as the word, no lubrication required. They're torsionally soft, so they, they actually dampen vibration. They're pretty inexpensive and easy to install, and you can replace the elements, the rubber components when they wear out. They also do act as an electrical isolator, so they stop electrical arcing. Some of the cons, they have limitations, and this is important to understand. Speed limitations, they also can generate heat and also oxidize depending on the uh, environment. So temperature, oxidation and corrosion uh, become a problem for some of these materials, these elastomers. And, and of course they do generate undesirable axial forces, axial being backwards onto the shafts or forwards depending on the design of the coupling. And this can then have uh, increased load on your bearings in the axial plane. So you have to then select slightly bigger bearings or, or be careful on the types of bearings you use. Then we're gonna jump into the metallic types of couplings. And, and again, a big shout out to our supplier Esco, a brand from Belgium with manufacturing around the world. Uh, and they've been a great partner and supporter of our business. So they're experts in the metallic coupling and coupling applications. So we're gonna talk about the lubricated and non-lubricated categories. Um, so typically your gear couplings are lubricated and then non-metallic disc couplings, as they say, non-lubricated. Uh, and these then come into more specialist applications, higher speeds, higher torque. Um, the non-lubricated couplings, disc packs, widely used in petrochemical and refining applications and we'll get into that so we've done some interesting uh overviews here just to, to try and help uh engineers and design engineers and maintenance technicians you know you've got a coupling installed uh, it might have come from the oem and this can help you make a decision of you know what should i be doing to increase my availability at my factory or to fix problems that I'm having. Maybe you're having some frequent failures of the coupling. Maybe you're having some frequent bearing failures or vibration. So, you know, a jaw coupling is, is a well-used coupling in many basic applications. The initial cost is pretty low. Lifetime cost also fairly low, but you've also got to factor in that the life expectancy is low. So you need to stop the machine to replace the elements and for some more critical areas, you probably want to consider a better design. So if we look at the tire coupling in a, in a shear, so this is a shear plane, uh, typically these life expectancies are longer and a lot easier to do the installation. So your downtime is reduced and they handle more misalignment, two degrees to four degrees angular misalignment. Compared to a jaw coupling, you're only getting about one degree of uh, misalignment. If we look at the grid coupling, so for those of you in mining, you've probably seen this all over your factories. Um, grid couplings are very popular. They're a spring steel member. They require lubrication. So when we look at the initial, uh, initial cost is fairly low but the lifetime cost increases because you need to lubricate the coupling more regularly. But you can also see the, the capabilities for torque. And, and this is an interesting aspect because the range of grid couplings, the sizes can be very large. So more than you know, a million inch pounds of torque capability. If you compare that to a tire coupling, you're typically in that 50,000 inch pounds and sorry, I haven't done this in, in metric units. Um, also, if you look at a, a jaw coupling, it's on that lower end of torque capabilities. So you wouldn't select a jaw coupling for some of the larger shafts you have. You would typically start using grid, gear, 
and disk type couplings. I mentioned the disk as being uh, part of ESCO. This is pretty interesting. Initial costs can be fairly high because of uh, balancing certification, uh, the way that these couplings are, are designed and precision built. But then your life expectancy can be infinite. And typically, disk couplings from ESCO are designed to have an infinite lifetime, which is incredible. So you can install a coupling. If the environment doesn't do any damage, the coupling will run infinitely. So that's great. Less maintenance, less downtime. Okay. Gear couplings. These are very common in steel industry and uh, cement, pulp and paper, uh, where you have a large application requiring high torque capacity. And you'll notice the highlight here, power density. So this is a relation between the diameter of the coupling, and the shaft capabilities and the torque that it can transmit. So the gear design is unique and this can be up to 500, 600 diameter shafts. Um, it's really incredible to see the size of gear couplings available. Um, and you'll notice misalignment capabilities are not too bad, one and a half degrees of misalignment if you have a flexible on both sides. Um, and even the speeds for these couplings, you can reach up to that uh, 8,000 RPM with special execution. Okay, so this is a great table that, that was put together. Um, and typically it, it'll help highlight some of the, what I say, pros and cons um, of different coupling designs. So it's a, it's a nice guideline when you have an application, either you're selecting something new or you have something existing that's giving you problems and you want to upgrade or you want to understand why it's causing issues. And we'll look along the top, we've just got a lubrication and these are the basic categories. There are some more unique couplings that would fit into this table, but we haven't gone into that much detail. So let's have a look at some of the applications. We're making good time and uh, hopefully we can get some great questions. So, so we'll consider these are the typical applications that, that we find around Southeast Asia. I've sort of highlighted a couple of them, mining, um, cement, steel, cranes and hoisting and pulp and paper. These are the large heavy industries, um, even in places in renewable energies like water screws and water turbines, compressors, pumps and fans, water locks and wind turbines. Couplings are associated with these, these industries. So this is a, an, an example of a, a pinion with gearbox and a great spacer coupling linking up this application, very common in, in a lot of the mining installations. And I wanted to highlight some of the OEMs that ESCO deal with, and, and you'll probably see these brands uh, throughout the industry. I know SEW is well known and Nord, uh, David Brown, Bravini, these are great gearbox manufacturers uh, that we see in the marketplace. And of course, many of them as OEMs use gear couplings and disc couplings. So if you've got an OEM that supplied you as a gear set, well, you most likely have a coupling and you'd be able to then look at alternatives and, and come to us and discuss some of the problems you might be facing. We're happy to help. Here's a typical layout uh, of a ball mill drive in, in mining industry, uh, as well as cement industry. And you can see just from this app, uh, photo overview, yeah, sorry, a drawing overview, there are a number of applications where coupling would be used. Uh, you know, point number one is a high speed coupling, joining the motor to the gearbox on the input. Uh, number three and four, where you have a spacer coupling, typically gear in this uh, position, low speed, high torque, connecting with a long center distance and a spacer shaft. Then you have uh, at point number six, uh, typically you would have a small coupling linking on this, uh, we call it a barring drive 
or a inching drive for maintenance purposes. And then at point seven, you'd probably have a coupling with a brake disc. So there's a lot of unique features that you, you might see and come across. Um, we're happy to help. So I hope this sparks some of your, your thoughts around these applications. And each one of them has their own specific requirements. Conveyors, very common, especially belt conveyors where you have um, multiple drives driving one belt. You'll often need more than one coupling joining the, the motor, gearbox, and gearbox to conveyor system. Rotary kilns, as you can see from the photo below, uh, this is with a uh, drive straight through the front uh, with a long spacer shaft highlighted there. And then, of course, gearbox linking with uh, spacer coupling to the main uh, head pulley um, or to the crusher. And there are some unique features that you need to understand when it comes to these types of applications. A typical arrangement for a ball mill or a rod mill or a sag mill or a kiln. And this particular uh, picture is showing a kiln, a rotary kiln in cement industry. Um, and you'll have your main motor driving the gearbox with the output shaft having a spacer coupling. And typically this is so that you can also have the, the, the room, uh, the space. So you need the coupling there to take up that gap between the two shafts. And this would be a gear coupling with a hollow spacer. Then of course, you've got the brake disc type of couplings to control speed. Here we can see another example um, of a ball mill for cement industry crushing. Uh, typically, wherever you have these covers or guards, you'll find a, a coupling below that. Okay, cement industry again, Typically large conveyors, ball mills, sag mills, and crushes, there are always going to be couplings there located. And then you need to consider lifetime of the coupling, misalignment capabilities. Um, these are important considerations. To highlight again, in uh, not so much in the Philippines, palm oil, but uh, definitely here in, in uh, across the border in Malaysia and Indonesia, a lot of um, areas where we can find vertical applications. Now, this is quite unique because a vertical mounted coupling requires, uh, specifically on the gear couplings, requires some special internal execution. And this is to prevent lubrication from moving out of the coupling, as well as to prevent the hubs from moving downwards. So, just to highlight, this is the level of detail we go into when we look at the application. If it's vertical, what type of coupling is needed for a vertical application? Uh, and what effects are we going to have on the installation? And also, just to highlight, ESCO does a specific 42 chrome molybdenum design coupling for the hubs and what this does is it dramatically increases the torque capability of a coupling for the same size so you can see with uh, some engineering and some selection of the correct material for the coupling we can do some special things like increasing double the uh, the torque capacity of a gear coupling for the same size physical size so this is a consideration, especially where you have low speed, large diameter shafts. In this sort of area, if you have a coupling that is too big, the weight of the coupling also can put additional load on your bearings, which reduces their lifetime. So by looking at a higher spec gear coupling for that specific application, you could also increase the lifetime of your bearings, which are typically going to be large diameter and expensive. So I hope this uh, maybe sparks some, some interest.
uh, that these are special made to order options, but definitely available. Uh, another area is cooling towers. So uh, we don't have too much detail on these uh, for today, but just to highlight to you, cooling towers are a massive area. So uh, carbon fiber shaft, very unique, made with our partners in, in ESCO. And, and this is an application that uh, we, we've had some success. So if you do have requirements, reach out to us and we can talk a bit more detail about specific applications like this. You can see there the, the, the reliable gearbox and then your, your coupling on, on the right-hand side, the input coupling with a carbon fiber shaft. I want to just speed up a little bit here. So there's a lot more application stuff here that we can talk about. Um, typically, we'll share notes of this. A uh, bit of a highlight here in Singapore at Marina Barrage, we have some couplings installed at the Marina Barrage, which are responsible for pumping water between uh, the barrage. So it's a good success story. Uh, in steel applications as well, uh, and I'll just jump on a little bit. So excuse me for, for pushing forward, but I'd like to get to some of the other content. Here we have a coupling with a brake disc, uh, very common in, in steel industry for uh, modulating the speed of various applications. And then pulp and paper and wood, always uh, many applications for couplings there. Yeah, just to highlight some of the OEMs that we've dealt with, uh, and some of you will recognize them. You might have some of this uh, equipment installed at your factory, the likes of FlowServe and Sulza, very popular many more uh, KSB being a, a big supplier around Southeast Asia of pumping applications and solutions. And in the marine industry. So let's have a quick look at coupling selection. So for those of you um, that need typically get involved in this, uh, there's some criteria that we need to look at. Uh, lubrication, overhung loads, unbalancing, axial forces, dampening, these criteria um, you might need to consider for some of those special applications. And if you're not uh, feeling confident, reach out to us and we can have a, a more detailed look to some of those specialist applications where you uh, are there critical. Um, and this, this you can then use as a guideline just to say, oh, if I use a disc coupling, I don't need lubrication. That's a bonus for me but I might have issues with um, torsional stiffness. I actually need vibration dampening. So then you might not select a disc, you might go for uh, something elastomeric. So th this, this we can definitely discuss further. So how do you start a selection? Well, you need the application data. So what is the motor or the driver? And what is the power rating? Then you need to look at the, the speed. So at the coupling, so what speed will the coupling be rotating at? We then need to consider the shaft diameters for both sides, the driven and the driver. And keyway details, because in some instances there might not be a keyway or there could be a spline or two keyways, etc. So that's a consideration. What misalignment do you expect from the application? Could there be some axial movement? Could there be angular misalignments just because of the way the, the system is set up? And then what is the distance between shaft ends, DBSE? So that's an important consideration because we've got to take up that space, the DBSE. And then we would use this data to look at the specific application and select a service factor. All right, so there are some considerations, ambient temperature, are there any particular critical frequencies we must avoid, especially for those higher speed applications like turbine generators? Are there space limitations? Um, are there any limitations on the axial forces or bending moments or unbalance? And then are there environmental considerations you know is it going to be in a hazardous zone will it have uh, acid in that atmosphere so these are pretty 
straightforward in general knowledge. So just be clear, this is going to be uh, something to, to consider before you make a full selection or a, a new selection of a coupling. Here we would look at the typical torque calculation. So, so as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, uh, power, speed are related to torque. And we have the, the factor there for uh, the metric units. Please be bear in mind for this uh, formula, you need to use the correct units. Uh, that's kilowatts and RPM will give you Newton meters of torque. Uh, and then the factor of 9550. If you're going to use inch pounds, you need to use horsepower and RPM and a different factor, 63025. So just bear in mind if you're doing that uh, calculation or selection. And of course, we have various tables that give you guidelines on the service factor you should select. All right, and there's plenty of data to support this uh, and guidelines of recommended service factors when you're doing a selection. Okay. So I'm just going to rush forward a little bit here. This would be a typical criteria selection sheet. So if you have an application, and you're looking for support, um, you can fill out one of these and shoot it to us and we'll be able to do the selection for you and help you. Um, or we can go through it together uh, and just pick up some of the criteria that you need. Okay, so I think I've highlighted most of that. Um, okay, so we're just going to jump ahead a little bit. I'm going to give you a quick few moments of uh, support data. Which, which I think is uh, pretty good. Um, give me a second here. All right, so just to, to highlight a couple of things here for, for clearance and fit. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, if you if you will uh, allow me here. And this this information, a lot of it will be available after the webinar. We'll send this out to you, those participants. Um, want to just highlight some of the uh, criteria that you need to be careful of, um, and that's specifically around uh, these these areas of certification. So, when you have a critical application. Uh, specifically in areas like petrochemical uh, hazardous zones, you might need to, to consider that you need ATEX certification and ATEX approved components. Um, you might also need API, um, which comes with some its own criteria. You might need balancing, dynamic balancing for the coupling. If the speed is roughly 3000 RPM and above, you should consider balancing. Uh, there are some more accurate requirements than that, but as a, a thumb uh, benchmark. Um, so please bear in mind, these are something we can provide for, for those specific applications and advise you, but be careful. You don't wanna go and select a coupling or install a coupling into an application where you need the certification. Uh, because it can have some pretty dangerous effects, especially in hazardous zones. So bear that in mind. Okay. And we can provide some of those. This is a, just a quick overview of the zones, typical zone one, zone two, and, and zone zero, and what that means. And then I wanted to touch base, so I've got a couple more minutes here, is reliability centered maintenance. Now. This concept uh, has been around for a long time, but it, it's always important to hold this at the center of uh, your uh, work, especially as engineers in the field. Um, you know, we've also got to look, Lawrence mentioned at the beginning, alignment and the methods of alignment. We've come a long way from using by eye or by using the six inch rule. These are accurate to a certain level, but with technology now, you know, we can, you can see from, from these photos, uh, using a clock a dial indicator, yes, it's still practiced, but 
laser alignment equipment is pretty readily available these days and quite cheap. So once you understand that, once you use it and you can use it in certain applications, um, it really has great benefits and, and you can see a lot of successes. Uh, so wherever you can train your artisans, train your teams to, to use the tools that they have to be as accurate as possible because the effects can be dramatic. And I just wanted to uh, share a little cheat or alignment tricks. So these tools, these little hand tools that um, you can produce in your workshop can really quickly help you to do alignment. So, you know, if, you, if you're doing uh, alignment practice and you use these type of little hand tools uh, to help you during adjustment to make those finer micro adjustments before you enter shims, um, you know, these things typically can be quite useful and helpful. Okay. Other things to consider, thermography. So a lot of uh, even smartphones these days, from what I understand, you can use as a, a heat camera. So these will help you to identify problem areas. And you can see from this uh, thermographic image on the right-hand side, the, the motor is red hot. And, and this will cause damage to your lubrication and bearing failures, et cetera, because the coupling is misaligned. All right. And then, of course, pay attention to your PF curve. You know, if you can start educating your teams, practicing uh, good installation practices, uh, using the technology available, you can dramatically reduce your maintenance costs and, and also just through the correct selections of couplings for the application, you can have huge advantages. This means you can focus on other things. And there's a bit of uh, work that's gone into the reliability centered maintenance. So uh, this, please feel free to follow the link. Uh, it's a great area of data uh, where you can get some, some help on reliability. Uh, and we actually did some tests between different coupling types. So this shows efficiency. So electrical efficiency versus misalignment. So if you misalign your coupling, your motor has to work harder to keep turning. And this then costs you money because it's electrical power usage. Um, so I was involved personally with this master's thesis um, and then you can follow the, the link and, and have a look at the journal. So uh, it's quite fascinating to see the dramatic impact of misalignment for both angular and radial. So if you just do the installation correctly, things will last longer and they'll cost you less money. All right, and then of course, there's the, a few details around uh, how, how uh, mature is your reliability and maintenance and how mature are you in your practices. And there's a lot more literature and data around this. Uh, I've put some photos here, some horrific instances where we've seen uh, incorrect lubrication no lubrication. So photo speaks a thousand words. So if you do have problems and you want to share them with us, photos help a lot. And we can then give you advice straight away um, of possible causes. You know, things like fretting corrosion could be a poor product design for this particular application where you've got fretting in the discs causing premature failure. And then a selection problem where the, the tire is completely failed because it's undersized for the application. All right, so that's me. Lawrence, I've gone over a little bit, so. Yeah, thank you, Donald. That was very informative. Uh, now let's go to the question and answer from, from our audience right now. So are there any questions from, uh, from the audience or from the participants right now? You can raise your hands. Uh, we have two questions, Lawrence. Yeah, okay. The first Go question ahead. is from Quinton. Um, mm -hmm. They're asking, hello, Donald. Uh, thank you for organizing this. How would you qualify the knowledge on couplings at the end user side? 
What importance do they give to couplings and how difficult easy is it to convince them on investing in quality couplings for longer cost efficiency? Interesting question. Yeah, so what I would say, it is quite interesting in Southeast Asia, maybe as a whole, um, the level of education uh, in Southeast Asia is in pockets and it's rapidly accelerating. Um, what I've noticed is a lot of end user customers, um, the older generation and the younger generation, their, their hunger for knowledge is incredible. Um, and there's that energy in these markets around Southeast Asia. And in the Philippines, the level of English is fantastic. So, uh, you know, a lot of the catalogs are mostly published in English and literature in English. So the, the guys and girls in, in the Philippines uh, typically have, have seen a, a great acceptance for knowledge and uh, sharing knowledge and understanding concepts of engineering and sort of that total value proposition. So to answer that question, I'd really say I've been you know, always impressed by um, the engagement that we get. And uh, Lawrence and I were at the PSME, the Philippines Society of Mechanical Engineers uh, exhibition. Um, and you know, you've got these young students just hungry for knowledge and it's fantastic. That energy is great. Um, so, so the level of acceptance, I think, is, is a lot higher than in other parts of the world. Uh, and I, I'm confident to say that in some um, more, how would I say, uh, to not sound too polit political, um, but some areas, yeah, it's been done this way for a long time. We're not going to change. Whereas I see from a lot of our customers, they're willing to, you know, they dig into the problem and they then try and find a better solution. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, Donald. Okay. Uh, there, here's another question from uh, Trimcore. I noticed I noticed that you didn't uh, touch on uh, chain coupling types. Where does it, coupling sits? Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so, so so chain couplings uh, pretty. It's a basic design. Uh, well used in many areas. I know palm oil uh, typically use a lot of chain couplings. Um, mm. It would sit in that metallic, the sort of a metal coupling. It can handle misalignment, but it needs lubrication. So the chain components uh, you know, are metallic and they need uh, grease lubrication. So it sort of sits in that gear coupling below the gear coupling because a chain coupling by its dimensions needs to be much larger than a gear coupling to transmit the same torque. And a chain coupling needs to be larger than a grid coupling to transport, sorry, around about the same size as a grid coupling mm -hmm. to transmit the same torque. But mm -hmm. the vibration dampening is slightly less than a grid and the torque characteristics are less than a gear. So we're seeing mm. in areas like rubber, rubber manufacturing, used to always be very common to use a big gear coupling on some of the mixers and large diameter shafts. But in actual fact, the cost of maintenance versus the, the diameter, the, the physical size of a chain coupling can be replaced by a gear coupling. So we're seeing customers you know, saying, well, I'd rather go for a gear instead of a chain coupling. So that's why I didn't include it in this uh, presentation. Okay, thank you again, Donald. Here's another question. Maybe we can have uh, two more because uh, it's already 11. So uh, one more is, uh, what type of coupling is the best for hammer, hammer mill, which have a RPM of 2,000 and 3,000 to 3,000? Now that's a, that's a good question. Um, Okay, so hammer mill, a lot of vibration. Um, typically in, this, in these type of situations, you want to dampen the vibration if you can, but knowing that a hammer mill is, is going to be near impossible to dampen all of the vibration, uh, gear coupling can be an option uh, because of the physical size of the gear coupling. It can handle the torque peaks, the peaks that you will see through the 
the cycle of a hammer mill. So that, that cyclic loading, gear couplings can be quite strong in that sense. Um, I would be scared to recommend uh, some of the, the hybrid couplings with rubber where you have, um, they use them in, in the shipping industry quite a lot, which is uh, uh, elastomeric coupling, highly flexible, used um, to join like the, the diesel generator to the, the propeller um, because of the, the vessel moving around. Uh, they use these highly flexible uh, couplings. But in, in a hammer mill, I wouldn't venture into that because the, it, you've got cement, you've got heat, you've got all sorts of other problems that come with that. So I would probably go with the gear, gear coupling as being, being a recommendation for that type of mm. application. And then look at the balancing. If it's running at 2,000, 3,000 RPM, look at the balancing of the coupling um, if you need to. Uh, and then do the selection with the right service factor. Okay. Thank you. And uh, are there any more questions from uh, the audience? Uh, some are, some questions. There are a few more, uh, Lawrence. Um, the question from Apple is, how do you measure the dimension of a spider coupling? Ah, perfect. Okay. So, so spider couplings... Uh, a little bit tricky because in, in industry, there are multiple brands. So you've got to be careful about interchanging the, the spider element. So what I would normally do is measure the outside diameter of the hub. All right. So you can get an idea of the outside diameter of the hub, which is uh, you, you have the flexible uh, elastomeric rubber element, which is your spider. Then you'll have the hubs, the metal hubs that uh, the spider goes into. Measure that outside diameter because that can give you a first basis of what physical size uh, spider coupling you have. Then compare it. We have in, in, in our Fenner catalog, we do have spider couplings. Or we call it JAW, J-A-W couplings, and see if those match. The, the hub diameter matches anything in the catalog. Alternatively, if you only have the spider element, um, it becomes a little bit trickier because some of the elements don't interchange with other brands. So you've got to be careful. If you have a curved jaw spider, so the, the sides are curved, this is commonly used with a brand called Rotex. So, and then there are some other uh, alternatives in the market with the curves, but their spider might not fit your hub. So you've got to be a little bit careful. So I would start with that is what is the diameter of the, the hub and then have a look at the catalogs that, that are available. Okay. 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 RJ is so, asking another question um, for normal operations. How long the service life of a jaw coupling rubber is? Uh, okay. So so jaw couplings, uh, typically, you know, again, it comes down to the selection. So if it's normal operation, environment is, is okay, you've selected with the correct service factor. And now bear in mind, jaw couplings have their own uh, service factor table. Each design of coupling, whether it's gear, grid, disc, jaw, you need to look at the specific service factor from the, the manufacturer of that coupling or from that design. And, and if you've selected the correct service factor, I mean, we should be running anywhere from 10,000 hours, which is like five years for a coupling. Um, if, you're in, if you're in that two years is, is kind of like, okay, you should see sort of two years seems to be fine. And that is also bear in mind that the rubber starts to degrade as it gets to your three years and, and older. So I would say the, the sweet spot, probably 24 months, two years. If you're getting less than that from a jaw coupling, uh, you might need to look and see, uh, you might have some environmental issues, a little bit hot, it's exposed, it's in the, in the sun all the time. So the heat is higher. 
if you go from 25 degrees Celsius, as you start getting warmer, 30s, 35, 40, 45, the rubber lifetime also decreases because of the temperature. Um, the rubber starts to, uh, we call it cure, and that's as it's operating, it's absorbing energy and heating up. And then if you've got environmental temperature, the rubber will degrade faster. So we target like two years. If you're getting two years, be happy. If you're getting one year, maybe consider to look at a bigger coupling or a different design. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, one more question, Donald. In heavy loads, uh, how do we select a coupling? Ah, okay. So, so when we talk about heavy loads, right, uh, that can be subjective. You know, you say heavy loads. Uh, uh, normally, we need a bit more information. And, and by and large, look at the application. Is it critical? So will the factory stop uh, if this coupling fails? Will the, will the factory stop? Um, are there humans involved? You know, somebody could die. There could be some danger to human life. So uh, those first priority criteria. The second one, when you say heavy load, um, is, it, is it heavy load for the, the shaft size that you have? So, you know, um, if it's a 50 millimeter shaft, heavy load on a 50 millimeter shaft is different from heavy load on a 400 millimeter shaft. So try and get your idea around that. Um, and then understand uh, if you have, uh, I'm assuming it's probably a big application and heavy loads being it's a big application, physical size. Look at probably gear coupling is, is one of the first places I go. When you have heavy load, gear coupling. The reason is because a gear coupling for its diameter is, is very strong. So um, then you can consider, okay, do I need vibration dampening? If I need vibration dampening, okay, maybe not gear, I might need to go to a grid coupling for heavy loads. Okay. And that's, then you would go through that process of elimination. Um, yeah, hope that answers the question. Okay, so it's uh, 11 now. Our, uh, I think we have is... uh, one, last, one last request uh, and mm -hmm. then we can close on that. Madhu. Donald, Madhukar is asking um, if, if we can get uh, the customer mapping for gear, disc and carbon composite couplings in Philippines uh, because he wants to relate it with the various OEMs where they supply in India to support the local salespeople. Yeah, absolutely. So that is that is a, a big work in progress for us. And, and that's one of the targets of this uh, webinar is to develop that interest uh, and get the customers, you know, giving us feedback around the applications you have uh, and some of the OEMs that support you. Um, because from that, we can definitely, uh, you know, we build those successes. Uh, we have had some great success with the number of uh, large customers around the region, both in cement, pulp and paper. Mm -hmm. We service uh, some large customers in the region and mining. So um, that, that trust and that, that's something we want to keep building with you as the customers out there. So uh, we look forward to keeping in touch and any of your questions, yeah, please feel free to shoot them to us. Okay. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for on this event, uh, our distributor, Arbor, uh, to all the organize, organization that supported us on the first uh, Let's Talk session in the Philippines, the PSME, the junior PSME, Mr. Christian De Delia of Philippine Mechanical and uh, Design Fabrication, my alma mater, TIP Manila, General Milling, uh, Serangani Energy, Team Energy, UPPC, global power and let's talk again in the next session bye all right everybody there'll be a survey and when you end this uh, uh, webinar please fill out that survey thank you so much your certificates will be sent to you via email thank you and have a nice day